Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DevRel Radio, the podcast where we tune into the heart of developer relations and community. And I'm your host, Oli, and I'm joined today by Victor and Baru. Hi there. Hello. So this podcast, as you know, probably is about oranges. Uh, I would say oranges and fertilizer. Yes. So if you don't know what the hell we're talking about, go back to the very first podcast in this season and check how Victor talks about the role of developer relations in the company and how to build community. Apparently, he was not the only one who came up with the idea. And I'm happy to introduce you to our guest today, Dalia Spasova. Well, thank you for inviting me to be a part of uh, this podcast, Vic. I, I appreciate it. Uh, so my name is Dalia. I work as a senior global community manager at Kong. I've been here for about, I think, two years. Before that, I used to work in Elastic. And before Elastic, I worked at Uber. That's where I got into tech. I didn't study computer science myself. So I studied business when I was in school. So I have very diverse background, for which I'm actually very thankful. I think it really helps working in community management to have such diverse background. And working as a project manager at Uber, um, then I got my job in Elastic where I fell in love with community management. Um, and ever since then, I've been in that space and I don't intend to leave. No day is the same twice, that's what I would say. And I'm currently in Amsterdam. Actually, I just relocated. I was in London the past three years, but I just relocated back to Amsterdam. I actually did my bachelor and my master here before. So yeah, now I'm back here where I intend to stay. That's a little bit about myself. The first, like this is the podcast where we're asking controversial question. Do you think that community can be managed? You know, I have a quote from Office where the Michael was talking to HQ and they're saying, I was under impression that I won't be managed. Who gives you that idea, Michael? That was my impression. Every time we talk about community, um, is it is it right way to call it like a community management or it's better to call it like more community engagement? Two, one. So before we were interrupted by our technical issues, I was asking questions about the naming the things, because the, if you watch the first episode, we were talking about naming the things and how different people don't know what the DevRel is and uh, how we talking about this. So that's why like every time, not, not every time, many times I hear this uh, uh, question from the people like how this community can be managed. Like, can we manage community or it's better to engage and call it community engagement for, for that, for that better? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I think you can try to manage it. I don't know if you will succeed and I'm not sure that you're supposed to. Communities are supposed to happen organically. That's the whole point. I don't think that organic growth can be managed. You can certainly engage within the community. Um, I guess we call it community management because of the different programs that we run in order to engage with the community. Uh, but it's not precisely to manage the community members, right? Most of them are doing it for... Not for fun, but because they like the technology, they like working with like-minded folks. So you can't really manage, right? People who are not even within your company. Uh, so yeah, I would agree with engagement. Yeah. Okay. So um, since Oli already touched this topic a little bit, we, we started talking about the how DevRel is fertilizer for growing the things. And I, I, I thought that it would be a great idea to bring Dale because one of the presentations that she did uh, some time ago, but it's actually like sparked a lot of ideas in, in my uh, brain. Talking about community, the way how you grow in things or like plants uh, in your garden. So yeah. in this case, it's, out, it, it's not the management, right? So you're not managing your plants there, but you you're still gardening. need to make sure or the, yeah, yeah, you need to make sure that they're getting like enough attention. You still do some of the things to this, that you maybe bring in different, uh, different cool boxes, you know, need to get them from one place to another so they can, you know, sprout. Again, I'm not stealing your thunder. Like, can you briefly talk about this idea about, uh, gardening and how this apply to community? Yeah, sure. Well, actually, we came up with this idea when I was in Elastic with my one of my previous managers, Elisa. She kind of inspired it in me. That's how I developed it. It's not really an approach, I would say. It's more of a framework as to how I look at like the whole community management strategy overall. Because 
Community management includes so many different parts. Sometimes it's hard to remember everything. What's part of it? Like, it's just so many things going on at the same time. So many different people from different departments involved. So it's sometimes it's hard to have a to have the big picture in front of you. So this analogy kind of helps me think of everything in one place. And you will see it on the screen when we include a picture. But if we start from the beginning, you have your soil. So these are, you can think of it as like the region and events. So where are we planting our seeds? Is the local area the right place to start a user group, for example, a meetup group? Um, should we organize, let's say, a Kong meetup or a Kong meetup with, in collaboration with someone else? Or is it better to partner with an existing tech community? So these are the type of questions that you ask when you look at your soil. Then we go into, you need to water your soil, right? So as a water, I think that that's your developer content. So are we providing our community with the right amount of content? So is it enough water and is it engaging? So that's where Victor will come into play. So he would be saying what kind of content we need, why, which areas, maybe some areas are not ready for like higher level content. They might need some more beginner content. So you need to be aware. I'm not the Victor specifically, maybe yeah. kind of like a developer, uh, yeah, developer yeah, advocacy, yeah. <laughs> advocacy team or uh, people who, you know, technical, uh, technical uh, developer relations engineers, they also work on the content, um, stuff like that. Yeah, just uh, to yeah. point out that uh, the, the Victor not necessarily needs to be like everywhere um, in <laughs> the organization, else. Even, yes. even though it could be cool, probably. But yeah, so do we have the right amount of content? Is it engaging? Uh, is it enough? How often it is? So then you look at that. After that, we look at the containers. Where do we store all of these beautiful flowers? Is it in a garden? Is it in small pots? Like, what do you do? I think of that as the venue. So where are we hosting our meetups? Where are we hosting our conferences? And all of that. Just try to make it engaging. Try to make it cool so people want to come and attend. And then you need fertilizer for the ground. Um, so that would be swag food, beverages, social media promotion, anything that's going to spark more interest, that's going to increase attendance. Um, so just look at it like that. For example, everyone loves the Kong swag. So give out swag, give out some snacks, drinks, pizzas, beers, anything that you can uh, help to make it more interesting. Then we need to think of control. This can be anything from like vendors, sales pitches, competition. Sometimes the competitor might come and ask you to speak, you need to evaluate, is that a good idea? Um, you have maybe your sales folks want to come and do a sales pitch. You again need to see whether is it purely developer meetup or are you collaborating with them? Is it a good idea? So these are all things that you need to evaluate before you, you begin. And at the end, we have the light, right? Nothing can uh, grow without light. So that's the feedback. Always reflect on the community. So always take their feedback from the community members. What is working? What is not working? And then change next time. So that's kind of the framework. You see, Victor, this is how you explain it, not your rumble about oranges, oranges. that you did last time. Yeah, it, no one, it makes sense. No one understood what, what are you talking about. This is how you do it. Yeah, so um, fair amount of time uh, in the previous episodes we spent on talking about um, metrics, different metrics and whether we need them or not, like how do we measure our success, etc. So, and I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts on measuring the growth and engagement of the community. Yeah. And after talk, we're talking about the f fertilizer. It's, um, <laughs> it's kind of like my jam talking about fertilizer in this episode. So I will tell you how we measure growth at Kong, but it will be different for every company. So you first need to ask yourself, what are your goals and what are you trying to achieve? Like, are you trying to drive um, like numbers in terms of community growth or are you trying to drive engagement? So that would be not increasing the numbers, but engaging with what you already have. So depending on what you're trying to achieve, you will measure your engagement and your growth differently. For example, right now at Kong, we look at all of our developer channels. Um, let's say we measure our, how many me members on LinkedIn do we have? Um, all of the Slack channels, Twitter. So all of the social medias, we make sure that we see every month, do we have growth? Do we have decline? Why, if we have decline, we look at the posts. Then we also see, um, we look at our the different programs that we have. Usually if you have a big developer community, you will have some sort of ambassador program. It can be either a champions program. It can be some sort of contributor program. That's usually how the tech companies do it. For us, it's Kong champions. So we measure what do they do during the month? Like how many blog posts did they write? Do they speak at events? Do they answer questions online? All of these things are going into our metrics. 
um, we look at our contributors. So how many cold contributions do we have a month? How many of those contributions are accepted? How many are declined? So all of these things uh, go into our metrics. But again, whenever you decide what your goals are, then you can determine what's important for you. For us, it's important to grow the community in terms of numbers. So that's why we do user calls, tech talks. We educate the community with the newest material that we have with the newest releases, but also it's important to engage with everyone that it's a part of it. So that's why we do those programs, right? With the developers who can interact with us. What tools do you so, use yeah. to track the metrics? Because you, you said like a bunch of different metrics. And... So nothing fancy. We do it in literally a Google, a Google sheet, uh, which have just divided it yeah, year per year, quarter per quarter, and then month by month. Uh, so we just track the change, the percentage of change. And then when we see that there is some big change, we're like, okay, why? Like, what did we do this month? Why were we better than the previous? Maybe we should do it again. So we look at all of these types of changes. So you named a lot of uh, metrics and uh, as a, you know, you have a, like a background with, uh, with the company that does some observability stuff and which are those metrics actually actionable? Like the, which metrics the business uses to make some decisions. So like I would give you a comparison. In uh, we at the uh, Sartre, we don't track individual like community members, but we really have one metric that is business related and metric that, you know, new company. If there is a new community member from the company that we don't know, we really want to know. The question is from your metrics that you collect, which metrics business are using to, you know, to do some decisions, to make some decisions about certain things, because fertilizers are expensive. Someone has to pay for this. And uh, the, so how you will convince a business that this is important? I have something uh, I will tell you after that, what I think about the fertilizers, <laughs> another approach, which I'm more interested in. But to answer your question, I, I think that the, the ELT looks overall at the community, like the, the growth, like the numbers, how much has it grown throughout the years? And then they see, well, do we actually gain members? How much did it expand throughout the past year? And then, then they can see, oh, actually what they're doing, it's working. But for us and for sales, um, I would say one of the top would be like the user calls and the text talks that we do per month. We get quite a lot of registrations. So we try to maintain that constant. That means that the people are actually coming regularly to your things. They, they want to hear what you have to say. Uh, so that's a very important metrics, the consistency. Do you have the same registrations per month? If they're going down, why? That means something's off with your content or you didn't do your promotion right. So we look at that, but being consistent with those metrics is extremely important. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I want to share something something about being in an um, early stage startup. How I measure our community at ByteWax is actually something that is brought by how investors look at startup mm -hmm. and um, kind of into a trap where I need to show GitHub stars. Oh and, yeah. Uh, the no, I forgot the GitHub members. stars. You're right. We also have the GitHub stars. Yeah. The forks and everything. We measure all of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for me, it's, it can be simplified to number of members in Slack and GitHub stars, mm -hmm. which is not ideal because First, uh, th this is like a number which doesn't actually go down or it, it always goes up and it doesn't actually represent how many people involved into the community they can start it and then leave, which is good for me per se, because like, okay, I got the star, I don't have to do anything with that. But if you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. If you try to implement your community program so that you just get stars and uh, Slack registrations, then uh, nobody's actually engaged. Mm -hmm. And if we call it community engagement, then it turns out that when you're at this stage of a company, of a startup, then, then you're, in order to be attractive to investors, you're doing strange things. Thankfully, our CEO understands well why uh, we need to care about other things, but nonetheless, we, we have to take this into account and uh, consider it a lot. So, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. it's just my pain I'm sharing. 
It is actually very good, Oli. Uh, I think it, it's, it, it brought some, some ideas for the question that I want to ask about this. I like the framework. That's why I really wanted to, uh, to bring uh, Dahlia to, to the show because it's clearly, she clearly articulate like how, but we didn't hear, at least I didn't hear why. And Oli just mentioned this, some of these, uh, the, like, why we do in community. I think everyone in this podcast somehow involved with open source and open source is this the way how company trying to uh, bootstrap. So Dahlia, you started with the Uber, which was not kind of like open. There's some open source uh, activities mm. and people like to use that, like why the companies like Uber wants to build a community. Like for us, like vendors who is open source, they're trying to build a solution. They through open source, they engage with people. And after that, they try to sell them enterprise license. That's how many of our listeners thinking that that's what, what we're doing here. But for like companies that are like, like Uber, why you need to, why you need to have a community like, and how so you will develop this. I think that Ultimately, the why, like the question, the, the, the answer to your question is that ultimately each company is trying to achieve the exact same thing, generate revenue, right? It's just that with creating community or developer community, you're doing the same thing. You're just going through a different avenue. So let's say a marketing team is doing like a field event where they're inviting business folks, CEOs and stuff. The meetup, if you think about it, is the same thing, but we're inviting different audience, right? We're doing technical talks with developers. We're trying to not sell to developers, but we're going to towards a different audience, but all of us have the exact same goal at the end. So companies that are smart, who have, uh, which have developer communities, who have developers who are using their products should be doing that because if like, these are the people who use your products, like they need to be up to date with what you're doing. Otherwise selling to their bosses, you're just not going to work. Like you need to start from the bottom, like in elastic, we had a very, um, good saying like community step zero of the sales pipeline. That's what we used to say all the time. That's how our sales folks knew it. It's just, you need it in order to sell. Like you need to educate like the developers who will be using your products. In addition to it, also you can attract talent and hire developers who are actually expensive. If you build a brand around being a place where people do like cool stuff, where they build uh, technologists, then uh, you can either find um, and help your HR situation. Mm -hmm, certainly. Dali, you, you promised to talk a little bit about uh, the fertilizer and how to, you know, the, to convince that uh, the ELT and the overlords that, you know, fertilizer needs to be expensive and we need to bring this more. Because, you know, in order to sustain life, you already have a soil, you have water, and uh, sometimes like pest control. It will work, you know, it will work. And the, the, we know that the many, the trees are growing by themselves. Victor. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. I, I, I can do, I, I can do what I want. So, okay. I, I thought about it a lot before I came here, like what to say exactly on that part, but I think we all know that swag works, beer, pizzas, all of these things work. Like there's no question about it, but there's not much more to say about that. So I'm not going to talk about this, What instead I want to say is that, um, I spoke like a few months ago about on, on another podcast about community led growth. And I did a lot of research about it. And I actually want to focus on that strategy today. Because so community led growth is about bringing together your community and empowering them to drive organizational growth with you. So when we talk about communities, those, those can be customer communities, developer communities, partner communities, like all of them. So for example, with Kong, all of those are part of our community. We consider all of those people, our community. So. I want to say that like personally for me, community led growth is not just a strategy. It's sort of a movement, like a mind shift, if you will. It's about moving from, how do I say, from like the monetary resources for the success of the growth of your business to utilizing what's right in front of you. So the times that we're facing right now, like with the recession and everything, like last year was very difficult for many businesses. I know that operational efficiency, it's kind of like the holy grail that everyone is chasing. So only organizations that are utilizing their resources in the right way and they're creating growth opportunities, those will manage to stay, those will manage to succeed. 
um, in those economic factors that we're right now. Community-led growth, you can, you drive acquisition and operational efficiency with the resources you have available. So think of it that way. What, how can I use the community that I already have to help me drive adoption of the products and the services of my business? But here it's important to remember that that's a two-way street, right? You also have to provide something for, for them. It's not just they have the community has to do something for you and then there's nothing for them. So in, in this case, the community member should also benefit in some way. So it can be getting exclusive resources, different trainings for free, maybe getting access to like product announcements earlier, swag, events, all of these things. So it's about engaging the developers who are using their, your products uh, with different programs, like we do at Kong with the Champions program, with the Contributor program, for example. And by engaging them, they help you drive your business. So this is what I think that we should be focusing on. The fertilizers, instead of using paid programs, like you know the B2B marketing programs that are so expensive, you can utilize what's right in front of you for free, kind of. Almost. <laughs> the, the problem is that those programs are a long game. Correct. Uh, and uh, considering that in the current economic uh, climate, everybody are very focused on showing immediate results. Mm -hmm. uh, although spending less might be appealing, not being able to directly show and correlate the community value to uh, revenue can be a downside of presenting the community as a good solution for growth in dire economic times. That's absolutely correct. And that's why companies, tech companies who have developer communities like Kong, I know many other strong ones, they, they need to start doing that very early on because then it's an organic growth and the ball starts rolling on its own. And you, sometimes you don't even have to do anything and the resources are there. So you just have to make sure you start early. You don't miss your chance. I really like, because I really wanted to, Dahlia, to say the words that she said, because many people uh, forgetting about the future. Every time when the people talking about immediate results, they forgetting about, you know, yes, it is very difficult to maybe uh, make the company, uh, sus you know, sustainable, and working successfully in these economical conditions. But those economical conditions, they're usually kind of like a periodic. Though there's okay. bad times, good times, bad times, good times. This is not something that we as a kind of like developer relations practitioners need to be responsible. There's management, there's business people. They need to sort these things out. What we're trying to do, we're trying to pave the future for the company by building a strong foundation that will bring us up. So we really they will, want... They will sort it out by firing you. I mean, yes. that's, uh, if you say, this... like, just sort it out, that will be their solution. That's not what we want. Yes, it's, uh, you're talking about uh, the cost uh, cutting and uh, maybe trying to figure out the current uh, the model to cut expenses. What I'm trying to say and what was Dahlia was saying that the leadership needs to be on board with the strategy of community-led growth of the organization. Because, That's a long term. So the real growth. question is how the, the real question is how you get them on board. That's, if that's you will, the real if question. If you will stop interrupting me, I will try to get the point uh, back home. I want to hear the... Dahlia. I don't want to hear you. I hear I you want all to, day, every day. I want to bring and the I microphone back to And I want to do like a shameless plug here and say that Bitewax is not cutting on DevRel and we're actually hiring them. Sorry. That's, that's perfect. And uh, everyone who has a talk about in the, the some promotion about DevRel, you can be the sponsor of the show. Please uh, call our sales at devrelradio.io. Uh, so my point, what I'm trying to, to, to make is that developer relations practitioners in the company, they are very small number comparing to engineering, comparing to sales, comparing to other things. You know, uh, Dahlia might have like a few colleagues. Like you can count them on your hands as a finger or your hand. But like company like Kong has like over like 700 people or whatnot. With community, you will get those people who genuinely would be interested in helping company. And the, the, this is very important where leadership needs to understand that they cannot just simply milk community and they need mm -hmm. to use community to interact and communicate. And I will stop right here. Yeah. No, oh, you're you will. Okay. <laughs> So what, what Vic said, that's, you're absolutely correct. And what's, what everyone needs to understand that community-led growth is a long-term strategy, right? 
all of these B2B marketing campaigns, they can produce the immediate results maybe, but you need to start the ball rolling and that will be a very long-term but very successful growth that you will have at your community. And then Baruch, what, what you said, um, how do you get ELT on board? How do you get your managers? You did need to do internal education a lot. So that's what I learned in Elastic, at Kong. A lot, a lot of even like the sales folks, the partner folks, even in, in engineers, they might not understand exactly what we do and why we do it. Um, because you have your normal sales approach, uh, normal marketing field event. But why are meetups important? Why are you going after the developers rather than someone else? So you just have to educate internally. But once so, we, so once what you is do... what is your message to to all those groups? Let's get practical for a second, okay? So I mean, let's say yeah. uh, they, they they think about you, whatever they think about you. Probably it has nothing to do with what you're really doing. How do you explain your value to those groups? Honestly, now I start explaining it with numbers because the numbers are there. Uh, now we're measuring everything with Kong. We associate everything in Salesforce because it's easier to track. How many people attended the meetup? How many opportunities it will influence from the developer side? So all of these numbers speak for themselves. Um, but when I attend sales meetings or engineering meetings, I just explain again and again what meetups are, how, what kind of people come there, why is it important to go after them, their background um, and stuff. You repeat yourself, but it's important. That's how you get the message across. Oh, for sure. Oli, I have a question to you. So that the the scale of the companies matter, and also probably Bark, because we have a good representation in terms of like uh, the, the type of companies that we work for. So the Quang is already kind of like I cannot call it a startup. I'm sorry, it's already kind of like a established uh, organization pre IPO. Probably we have a startup mm -hmm. with uh, like a, uh, like. A, maybe tens of engineers, like one Oli and CEO who are working on the DevRel. We have a slightly bigger companies like Chartree and the Gradle that not the big as Kong uh, yet, but uh, also how you would approach this type of thing, Oli, for example, for smaller companies, how you would have this conversation? As Dahlia was talking about it, I was thinking about like how, how I do that. So, because our company is um, fairly small, I participate in engineering meetings two times a week. One is just a stand-up-ish type of thing where we track what we are doing. So I'm telling, they constantly hear from me what I'm like doing and what my expectations are. And another one is more relaxed, but if you have a demo or if you want to show something, you show and it's like a town hall. Everyone has a, like a time to share if they want to share. So um, during this town hall, sometimes I share a tool. I use a uh, common room for tracking community, and it okay. shows nicely how many active members there are there or who are the new organizations that came in and everything. So for me, it's uh, simply numbers are there, and I just share them. And sometimes I share the wins, like, Wow, we got our first thousand stars on GitHub. Yeah, I know it's silly, but still, I'm I'm happy to see that number. So, and engineers also get excited. I I show them like after this meetup, we measured how many people like reached out and everything. So it's more uh, for me sharing news. What about Baruch? How how Devrel is visible uh, in the leadership and other departments? in the griddle. So what, what we are trying to do is to establish a very clear framework of how DevRel contributes to different aspects of the company. How do we help sales? How do we help marketing? How do we help uh, HR recruitment uh, initiatives, et cetera, et cetera. For each and every organization that we, uh, or group within our organization that we help, we select one metric that resonates with them. And this metric is being constantly pumped into every conversation that we have. Like, so for, for, for us, we have a service which kind of bridges the open source and our commercial offering, the, the, the build scan. Um, it's a free service that you can use wherever you use any build tool in the JVM ecosystem, and you get a very valuable information from it. But it's also a showcase for our commercial product and sales understand it. So for sales, the more people 
are running build scans, the the clear the, the clearer the value of the community for them. Uh, uh, that, that. So we said, okay. So for marketing and sales, number for marketing mostly number of people who convert of doing build scan from a build tool this is a very clear number every time we speak with them we start the conversation and say hey by the way did you see that the number grew before we were talking about anything else we just like instead of saying hey good morning how are you we asked did you see the latest numbers in in, in build scans right and this is very clear of how we contribute to marketing with sales it will be anecdotes of our impact on their sales motions and their sales conversations. Again, instead of saying, good morning, how are you? We start, he's like, hey, we did a brown bag, like a launch and learn last time in this huge corporation. And, and we saw that they engaged with you after, right? And, and yeah. with HR, we start the conversation like, hey, did you see this lead that pays? They're actually from our community. We, we met them in a meetup. And now they're in pipeline in uh, um, in your recruitment process. We try to make it as simple as possible, but we try to remind all those people and in all those departments in the organization why we exist every time we come across their radar. Because otherwise, it will be like eh, those people just fly around the world having the time of their life, wasting everybody's money, and we yeah. don't understand why <laughs> they're doing that. So basically what you're trying to say is to somewhere like be visible. That's what I can say. It's Very like visible. What I learned Very throughout visible. the years is you have to, whatever work you do, you have to shove it in their face to everyone so they know of what course. you're doing. There's <laughs> the only way. There's and, only and, way. And having this clarity of message of why yeah. are we useful for this particular audience is, mm -hmm. is, is helping because you know, it's lots of time you ask me to, hey, Victor, what are you doing? Next thing you know, you will have an hour lecture and everybody are already asleep and whoever wasn't asleep already left and Victor will still yeah. going because he is excited about Generally, how many things he's doing. Generally true statement, uh, correct. All right. He's excited and he wants to talk about it. But what they hear, what they want to hear instead is this one day thing that is useful for them from what Victor is doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want to hear one thing about this episode that is useful for you and you care about developer relations and community, then remember, be visible. Yes. Yes. And consistent. Exactly. Number two. And check out and check out the flower the flower thing. It's very useful. It's a simple <laughs> message and it's awesome. Ideally, ideally, you need to have very good uh, executive uh, sponsorship, but also it's a two-way street you know you need to help them to help you so correct company needs to see what you do and they need to, everyone in the company to understand why you're doing this otherwise it's going to be a question like exactly what bark says everyone will be asking what victor is doing but no one knows what the victor is doing mm -hmm. correct Della, thank you for coming and thank you everyone for listening please go ahead and like this episode share it subscribe it was my pleasure to be Thank you so much. As always, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, enable notifications, enable uh, notification for new episodes. Uh, we finally have our X or Twitter and it's very active. Subscribe it there, retweet, share your friends, share your thoughts, engage with us. Um, because we, we, we want to have a okay. meaningful conversation with our listeners.